there's a lot of blame going around, rumors, gossip, people are on their guard. So this kind of hidden anger and, and passive aggressiveness that I have seen, it's always an eye opener with clients is how many people need to be CC'd on any given email. So the more people that are CC'd in anything gives you an indication there's a bit of fear. And so that shows you that there's generally low trust. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, welcome to We Are Only Human. I am Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm really glad to have you here today. And one of the fun things that I get to do in the work that I do day to day, and also just here in the podcast, is get a little bit more of a global perspective on things. And so I actually had a chance recently to work with one of her projects, got to see some of her insights, and honestly, I respect and appreciate what she has to say, what she's doing. And so I said, hey, would you be willing to join us? And here she is. So I have uh, Faye Ekong here with us. She's going to talk about some of the work she does. She's going to talk about strategy, change, dysfunctional organizations. And I know that might not be of interest to everybody. Actually, probably interest to everybody because we all probably face that. So Faye, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Absolutely. So anyone listening is, wait a minute, Ben's accent sounds different from Faye's accent. So tell us uh, where you're from. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to pick uh, my accent <laughs> in, in that <laughs> sense. So uh, I'm a little bit from all over, actually. I'm half British, half Nigerian, but I was born in Germany, grew up in Ghana and in the UK. And then I've worked in, in Italy, in Belgium, and for the past 14 years, been based out of Kenya. So I suspect that my accent is a mixture of many different places and influences. Yeah. (laughs) Wonderful. So now that we've gotten the physical and geographical background for Faye, take a few minutes and tell us who you are and what you do. So that's always an, it's an interesting question because of course, sometimes we gravitate to the, you know, professional, I'm a this, I'm a that, but at the same time, we can't really separate our professional self from who we are on an individual level. So it ties a bit together. So I'm the managing director uh, of a company called Ravelworks uh, Africa, and I'll get to that in a moment. But in that sense, I'm an OD, organizational development and HR uh, practitioner and very grateful uh, to have been able to go through the SHRM SCP certification process a few years ago. But I guess that also ties into who I am as a person. I'm very interested in how we as people grow, evolve, connect, both in a professional and, and at a personal level. So human behavior fascinates me and organizational behavior. And both of those two things are actually related, right? Human behavior yeah. is, <laughs> we can... My wife is a people watcher, and so she just loves when we're out and about just to see what people are doing and just observe them because it's always kind of a fun study on what's going on. We have a lot of kids, and so that that helps too is there's <laughs> people probably watching them thinking what in the world's going on over there. But at the same time, there's this, this side on the organizational piece. So I really wanted to talk to you about that today because you work with different companies to help them yeah. become more, more functional, right, to work yeah. the way they're supposed to work. And I'd love for you to take a few minutes and and let's have some fun with this. Talk about what a dysfunctional organization looks like, because uh, we might need to do like a, the drinking game where someone's like counting all these off as you're, as you talk through some of these characteristics, because there probably might be some that hit a little close to home for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think most of us can identify a dysfunctional organization. So it's just saying uh, when we refer to businesses, companies, and organizations, they're not amorphous, independent, you know, entities. They are made up of people like you and me. It's people make organizations. And as people, we have our own fears, aspirations, egos, goals, objectives that we bring into the work environment. When looking at dysfunctional organizations, there's a couple of things that kind of uh, come to my mind. One, I call them teenager organizations. When you are a teenager, that phase in life where everything's that nothing fits together, right? You don't know who you are, what you want to be. You want to be cool. You want to be all these kind of things. And you're a bit awkward. 
And, and sometimes we see that in, in organizations who are still moving from that being brand new to being a little bit established. And now you're you know, having to, to put some processes and policies in place and things are getting a bit awkward. But apart from that, look, a couple of things is really, it's when you are in environments where there's really a low trust environment and a low emotional intelligence. There's a lot of blame going around, rumors, gossip, people are on their guard, a lot of resentment, sometimes maybe compliance, but only not to get fired. So this kind of hidden anger and, and passive aggressiveness. I think a very practical one that, that we see or that I have seen it's always an eye-opener with clients is how many people need to be CC'd on any given email. So the more people that are CC'd in anything gives you an indication. There's a bit of fear. If the boss and the head of department are not there, I can't make this decision or that kind of wanting to, to be able to show that I'm working, I'm doing something, look, I'm CCing all of you. Or if something goes wrong, don't blame me because I told all of you. And, and then it's very easy to say, it wasn't me. HR was in copy, finance new, logistics, communication. So those are the kind of things I, I would say at a broader uh, level. And then, of course, if you dive into it, Ben, it, if you see a lack of kind of purpose, pride, belonging, a lack of meaningful work, if people can't tell you why do you do what you do, what do you like about this organization, and you get the kind of, well, it's a job, I'm here. How does your job connect to anybody else's or the wider organization? I don't know. As long as I get paid at the end of the month, uh, that's all I care about. So those are some of the symptoms, right? I don't know if your audience, uh, I, I'm sure there'll be a few where they're like, yeah. <laughs> like, uh-oh, uh-oh, wait a minute. That's us. Hold on. That, that CC uh, quotient, that number you just gave, I mean, like that idea of how many times do you have to send an email with a CC on it just to cover your behind? Exactly. I think that's a real it's a, it's a very real thing. When you said that, I had I had flashbacks for a second, thinking back to companies or positions or teams where I worked where that was the, the go-to because, and again, it stems back to the very first thing you said, oftentimes it's low trust, right? We're not sure who we can rely on. We don't have that. We don't have that psychological safety where we can, exactly. where we, can we can support each other. And so we're, we're just going to try to cover all of our bases just in case something happens and uh, know that someone's not going to go to bat for us. We've got to make sure and protect ourselves instead of doing that. And what's intriguing is the, the research shows that when someone is having to do that all the time, they're dedicating mm -hmm. a portion of their active brain power to mm -hmm. pr protecting themselves instead of putting all their creativity, all their focus, all their effort into actually solving whatever problem they're solving in the workday. So you're always getting less than what they have to offer when you have that kind of environment. People don't think about that. Yeah, there's an interesting graphic somebody in my team sent me recently, and we just laughed. That kind of shows reasons why I CC'd you in the email, and it's a pie chart, but it has all of these, like, to guilt you into doing something, or because you're my boss, and I want you to see that I'm online, particularly now with COVID, to embarrass you, to prove that uh, I, you knew about it. And then a very small percent of the pie chart, like 0 0.01, is I thought it would be genuinely helpful. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty good indication. And I remember in one of my previous functions when I was the chief HR officer for an organization and I inherited the post and a lot, I had nine different countries all over the world and thousands of staff, but the tendency was just to CC me, CC the director in everything, didn't matter what it was. And so I had to take quite a strong stance because what it meant was sometimes I'd have 400 emails in my inbox in a day, so I'm not going to read all of them. And so that was quite, it was an indication that there's generally low trust or whatever was going on, but that you feel always you have to go to the highest level. So I had to push back and I was very honest with people and said, look, if you CC me on something that's not critical, I'm not going to get to your email because it might be 380. I'm just going to check the top 10. So really hold it for something that is genuine and then tell me exactly what it is you want me to do in that particular scenario, you know, so putting the responsibility or the owners more back onto the sender to be like, if it's going to come to me, tell me what you need from me. Yes. Yes. I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of that. And I had a great leader, the last HR job that I had in the trenches kind of HR role, the leader mm -hmm. I had said, if you are copying me on something. I need to be doing that, whatever it is. If, if it's just something like keeping me in the loop, just file it away. I'll call you if yeah. I need that. I'll get back with you. But he said, as a CEO, if everybody did that, I would never be able to do it. Like you're saying, I would never be able to do any actual work because I'd be exactly. only focusing on trying to consume <laughs> this stuff when it's all 
just minutia. You're, there's a great book, and I'm completely blanking on the title of it right now, but it says we all have this, we have a zone of competency, a thing you can do. It might not be your best thing, but you can do it. You have a zone of incompetency where you're terrible at it and you shouldn't be doing it, but everybody mm-hmm. has a zone of genius where you are better than anyone else, and that is your yeah. area where you really shine. And yeah. unfortunately, email, those kind of things, I don't know how this transition over to email, but those kinds of things become a, they're a zone of competence for, uh, for pretty much everybody, yeah. but yeah. no one wakes up in the morning like, I cannot wait to go to my inbox. <laughs> that is how I'm going to spend my day and I'm going to end it feeling accomplished, but no one does that. And yet it somehow just ends up that way just by default. <laughs> so let's talk about, let's, goodness, I, I told you we had some fun with that one. So let's take it a step further. Yeah. And talk about the work you do isn't just to commiserate with companies on these kind of no. things. It's thinking about how do we evolve this? How do we change this? How do we tackle some of these issues yeah. and maybe break this habit we have as an organization or build a new muscle, a new habit that's going to lead to better results? So talk about that a little bit and how you approach it and tips and tricks that you found to be helpful there because that's not an easy thing to do, but you get to do a lot of it. So I'm kind of curious what you run across. Yeah, so I'm going to frame it a little bit in most of what I do or what we do is really on the people-centered perspective, right? So when we're looking at change or transition, it's not just can we develop a new org uh, org chart or do new reporting lines because that's really more at theoretical level. And I think particularly if we frame the change also in what's going on, not just now with COVID, even before COVID, then the whole fourth industrial revolution was changing the way that we work, that we engage, that we think about work, what even constitutes a worker from gig economy and part-time and more people leaving to say, I want to do on my own. So there's a lot of kind of change and, and transition going on within that. So it's there anyways, right? It's not just if you're doing a merger or acquisition or laying off people. So how do we go about it? Look, I always think that there's no, there's no right or wrong way. That's what I tell people. There's no right or wrong way to feel about a given change, which is going on in our organizations. We can't control that. People have emotions. You might be afraid. You might be excited. You might fear that you're going to lose power. So we're not going to judge about whether it's right or wrong to feel a certain way about the change process. But I always say that there is a right or wrong way to behave, uh, no matter what kind of change process is going on. And there again, putting that onus back onto you as an individual and raising your self-awareness in terms of what are you saying? How are you talking about it? How are you engaging with your colleagues on it? Is it more from a point of curiosity and asking questions and saying inquiry before judgment? Let me get the full picture. Are you rushing in and gossip kind of Uh, a role. And I think that's very important. Why? Because most organizations and companies will tell you, oh, we have a charter of, you know, values, ethics, and they will have lots of things in there, transparency, respect, empowerment. But when, what is that? What's the terminology? When the, what's the rubber hits the road or something like that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I got it. (laughs) But when push comes to shove, those things fall out, uh, out the window and people behave in the most ridiculous ways in a change process. And I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is really, it's, I, I don't want to say it in a bad way, but it's being able to call people out and say, Ben, no, you know, no, I understand this is difficult. We're going through changes, but come on, man, this is not how we're going to do it. So tell me what are your fears? What are your anxieties? Let me walk you through this. Let's look at it, but not in this way. You're not instigating people, spreading rumors. I like to borrow always there from Fred Kaufman, the behavioral economist. I do. Yes. Yeah. So, and he says, I love this one. Your drug dealer is not your friend. And in that sense, meaning when you get into these kind of employee pockets of, I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. Did you hear what she said? They're going to fire. Yes, they're going to fire us. That's like your drug, that drug of let's be in misery and complaining together. But none of those people are your friends. It doesn't help you. You're not growing. You're not evolving. You leave that conversation feeling, yeah, we're all angry. And then? It hasn't resolved anything, you know what I mean? It's, and then, so you keep going back. So I, I think that's the, of course, change, is, change management is complex, but I think it starts with the kind of, there is a right and wrong way to behave. And this is how we're going to behave in this process, despite our fears and anxieties. And this is how we're going to talk about it. This is how we're going to address it. And this is how we're going to call each other out when somebody is going off the rails. You know what? I, I wrote that down, actually. We're not judging people based on how they feel. I think that's a phenomenal approach because it's really easy to do that. 
but we can judge them on how they behave because that's something we can hold them accountable to. And th- the thing that comes back to me, I'm a, you ask me if, if, I'm a, if I know behavioral economics and I am a closet like economics fan. I always said <laughs> if in an alternate life, I would have become an economist just because I love that, that the science of how we make decisions so much. Yeah. And yeah. the, the thing that I come, come back to on a regular basis here on the show, it's a, just a regular theme through our lives is behaviors are really hard to change. But yeah. in this context you're talking about, they are observable. We can identify yeah. them. We can reinforce the right ones. We can negatively, uh, you know, yeah. uh, reinforce the wrong ones or whatever the word is there. Uh, we can, we can wean those out and whether it's calling out and that doesn't have to be mean or nasty or anything else. And there's a, I interviewed an amazing lady last year for an event, Ramona Burroughs, got her name, thank goodness. And her set, her talk was dealing with jerks at work. And it was like, we need to be able to call people out with yeah. respect, but don't be afraid to say that is not okay. We're yeah. going to, we're going to make this right because the second you tolerate that, and you've probably exactly. seen this a lot of times that becomes the, the threshold for, well, if you won't get in trouble for doing that. So you can be that bad and still be okay. Yeah. I think if, if you are not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, right? And, and we see this in dysfunctional organizations. It did, when you're talking about really extreme behaviors, counterproductive workplace behaviors, whether that is fraud, uh, theft, harassment, sexual assault, all of these things really at the extreme end, it didn't start that way. Somebody didn't walk in the office on their first day and start slapping people in the face. That is, a, it's a slow slope. You made a joke. We said, it's been, let's just leave it. It's uncomfortable. You made another joke. You push somebody. And every time you are testing the boundaries and you find, well, nothing is happening. So in most cases, we see that counterproductive workplace behavior does not happen overnight. It's been over years. Nobody has said anything. And then new people who joined the organization get to learn that, oh, this is the way to behave here. This is the only way to get ahead or to move. It's gracious. I'm getting all like fired up over here. I'm trying to fan myself and cool off a little bit because I'm, I'm getting so pumped about this topic. So <laughs> I want to ask you one, one question to come out of that, because again, a lot of people probably are hearing this and thinking, yes, absolutely. Faye is on it. <laughs> but what do I do? What do I, from my position as a leader, right? Is there a yeah. skill that I can build that will help me to address this? Is there a skill? Is there a competency that I need to have to be able to do that? Is there a culture thing we need to pay attention to? It's not a simple option. It's not a simple issue. If it was, you yeah. wouldn't have a job, right? People just take care of it, but you do have a job and, and, and you're plenty busy based on the conversations we've had. So <laughs> talk about the skills that the, the talent leaders listening to this, the, the business leaders that care about people, the, the skills they might need to help them along yeah. this path to help solve some of those problems we talked about. Yeah. You know what? I think there's two. Two main ones that I would refer to. One is, and many of your audience might know, Brené Brown, but, and I like a lot of her angles, but what she says is choose courage over comfort. So that's one, right? Because it's easy. Our brains are built to protect us. So naturally, when we face one of these uncomfortable situations at work, we're going to make all sorts of excuses and reasons on why I can't address Ben now. Or because it is Friday, because it is Monday, because whatever, it doesn't even matter. So I think there's, there's one question really that we need to ask ourselves, especially if you're in a leadership or managerial position is, am I choosing courage or comfort? And in most cases, what is the right answer, right? What needs to be done? The other thing is really, again, there's a beautiful book by Tash, uh, I think her name is Tash Yurik, who's a psychologist. Uh, It's called Insight. And it's on self-awareness, right? It's raising our own self-awareness. Oftentimes we all think, oh, I know how my behavior affects others and whatever. But actually, the more you really dig a bit deeper, you find that actually most of us have no clue, really. Not really well enough to understand, particularly in delicate situations of change and transition. So I would say if you're a leader, there's, if there's two things that you should be in, investing in, is raising your self-awareness, both your internal self-awareness in terms of how you feel about certain things and how that manifests itself outside but also your external self-awareness in terms of what is the impact of what you do, what you say, how you do it on other people and can you read the room. And the other one is, and it's, it's, it's courage, really. It is. You, we all know in, in the majority of cases, what is the right thing to do? And if you're struggling with that, 
a very simple exercise is think about somebody you admire professionally, a great leader or, or whatever it is, but, and, and just ask yourself the question, what would this person do in this situation? Would they stay quiet? Would they hide? Would they gossip? Or would they address it? No matter how uncomfortable uh, that might be. Mm, goodness. I had never stopped to think about it that way, but your, your, the neuroscience research shows your brain chooses the path of least resistance because it's exactly. going to conserve energy. I'm going to make it easy. So if I have a chance to make, there's a two paths in front of me. One's going to require a lot of effort and emotion probably and other things. Mm -hmm. The other one is just cruise control, baby. I'm just riding along. I can just uh, ignore those things. Your brain is going to choose that one naturally. We've got to for, we got to force it. We got to push it. We got to intentionally make that decision. Actually, as you're talking, I I got to post a note off my stack and wrote courage <laughs> and comfort and put it on the top of my monitor. And so I'm going to yeah. keep that there as a visual cue for myself. And I'd encourage people listening to this: do that. Do what you need to do, or think about what uh, Faye was saying. Pick that person that you respect and look up to. It could be Faye now after this conversation. Who knows? And say, hey, what would that person do in this situation? If you're not sure, you feel like you're but this might be one of those where it's, I need to make that choice. Think about yeah. that approach. Yeah. Goodness gracious. And, and look, Ben, in, in many cases, I've seen people will create so much drama in their minds without any data to back it up. You know, if I say this to Ben, it's going to be awkward. He's going to be angry. He's going to, all these things. And I always ask people, I say, what data do you have to back it up? Last time you said something to Ben, did he throw a staple at your head? Did he, you know, what happened exactly? No, I've never tried. So it's again, it's you're saying, it's that, protective mechanism that comes in and, and tells us all of these kind of dramatic stories when we've never actually tried. And the reality is most people we work uh, with, nobody shows up to work with the intention of being incompetent. Nobody comes and says, I've not been incompetent for a long time or difficult today, I'm just going to beat um, and I'm going to excel at it. Human behavior is not random. There's always something that's going on behind it, whether conscious or subconscious. Oftentimes you will find if you have those conversations where you call something out to a person, not in a judgmental way, or I'm blaming you, but really in an inquiry before judgment, trying to find out, being curious, what's going on. You will find sometimes people are not even aware that this is how their behavior was being felt by others. Or sometimes people will really open up and tell you, I know. And it's because I'm so stressed. I'm so whatever particularly now in the COVID time, we don't know what's going on in people's homes. So a lot of people are so stressed, so burnt out, you're looking after family members, elderly, whatever it is, there's a little bit more compassion, I would say, required from all of us and empathy at this point. I love that. I don't know how you found the person out through the stapler ad all those years ago, but no, I'm just kidding. No, I, I, I did my research. <laughs> She's been digging very deeply. Awesome. Okay. So we're coming up towards the end here and this went so quickly. I, I will have to find another time to come back together because I feel like I only scratched the surface of the amazing wealth of knowledge you have to share, Faye. So if someone is listening and they're like, I want more Faye, I want to know more about her. I want to follow. I want to you know, connect with you. What's the best way to do that? And the best way to do it is actually via our website. So we have a website, ravel.works. And, but we, you can also find us on all of the regular social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Ravel Works Africa. So it's Ravel like Unravel, but without the un. So it's just Ravel Works Africa. Yeah, on social media. We're not on TikTok. I hear that's the new thing, but I don't know what I would do on TikTok. <laughs> oh my goodness. I stapler throwing. What were Maybe. some of the other fun, what were some of the other fun things in the conversation today? We're gonna this is how you call someone out with love. Some what there's some there's something there we could weave into this discussion, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Okay. Faye, this has been so much fun. I appreciate you for hanging out, for sharing with the audience here. I just thank you for hanging out with us. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ben, and once again for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And yeah, we need to do this again, maybe a longer version. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I, well, I'm, I'll have to ping you about some, some events coming up. We'll find a way to slot you in because, goodness gracious, you're incredible. To everybody else out there, thank you for hanging out with us today on We Are Only Human. Think about your organization. Choose courage or comfort. Think about some of those great takeaways from Faye and the conversation today. Make sure you reach out and connect with her. I'll have the links in the show notes to, to the Ravelworks website, to their LinkedIn profile, all that other fun stuff. I appreciate you all for hanging out with us. Enjoy your week, and we'll catch you next time on We Are Only Human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. 
Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com. 